Welcome to the Next Gen Show. My name is Benjamin Brain, performance and leadership coach, and it's my mission to share with you the stories and experiences of accomplished next generation leaders from businesses across the UK. On today's episode, in a first for the podcast, I was joined by father and son duo, Adam and Kevin Pritchard of Linford Gray Associates. So Adam, the founder and managing director of Linford Gray, began his career in the creative industries, working for film and theatre companies after being on stage in the West End, before then taking a role as a management consultant in a small London consultancy firm. From there, it was clear to Adam that the advancements in technology meant that in order to stay relevant, accounting and accountants needed to change. So his vision for Linford Gray was to build a practice that looked and felt more like a fintech company, an advisory-led practice with an impressive tech stack that's leveraged to add value for clients. Kevin, Adam's father, is an experienced business turnaround expert, passionately committed to the growth and development of UK businesses, regardless of their size. Kevin sits on the board as chairman at Linford Gray, as well as several other companies as a non-exec director, and over the course of his career has built and sold several businesses the most recent of which was the multi-million pound sale of a manufacturing company to an AIM-listed company. So, for a brilliant insight into disrupting an industry and what it takes to forge a father and son relationship in business that works, let's get into it. This is Adam and Kevin Pritchard. Okay, so this morning I am joined by Adam and Kevin from, as you can see in the background, if you're watching, Linford Gray Associates. So thank you for joining us on the show, Adam and Kevin, a bit of a, a podcast first with father and son being on the same episode. So really looking forward to seeing how this goes. Yeah, good. Nice, nice, nice to, nice to be here. So we know a little bit about the intro, from the intro, about what, for, what Linford and Gray is all about and the service that you provide. Could you just give us a bit of an insight into what the process was up to launching the business? What the process was up to launching the business? Uh, well, I started my career working as a sort of actor in the West End and on tour. And I did a couple of tours and realized it wasn't really going to be for me in the long term. Started to train, do some courses, distance learning whilst out on tour, came back picked it up with Kaplan, got a job in London, uh, eventually moved back to Leicestershire after, you know, a few life choices and things like that. Uh, and it was there that I sort of, that I sort of honed the art. It was in Leicestershire that I took an office with, with my dad, with Kevin. Uh, and we worked together to sort of really hone the offer uh, and decide what it was going to, what it was going to, and, and, you know, and it, it's evolved. I think it's evolved over time, but that, you know, formulate the initial offer and what we how we were going to sell ourselves and how we were going to deliver on a, a scalable solution for small businesses uh, and medium-sized businesses and then you know we launched Linford Gray in November 2018 didn't we as Linford Gray so so back in your well up to the launch of Linford Gray Adam had you ever thought that going into business with your father was something that was going to be in the pipeline for you and and how did that sort of business relationship come about uh, we've always been very close, haven't we? Yep. Uh, I would venture to say that I'm the closest of your four sons. Uh, <laughs> probably the favourite. Uh, uh, but and I and I think I you know I grew up. Dad was has always been an entrepreneur for, for as long as I can remember. He's always run his own businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you know when and he used to, we used to live in Leicestershire and he used to have a lab in Manchester and so in the summers. We would be traveling, you know, we would do some work there for, for less than an appropriate wage as teenagers. Okay. And on the way there and, and on the way there and back, it would all be, you know, the conversations would all be about business. They would all be about, you know, the, about the, perform the strength of the balance sheet, the performance of the business, you know, your DLA, your tax positions, your dividends and how you, you know, generate wealth and the kind of life that you want to live, the kind of man that you want to be. And I would say that was, you know, that gets like you, you you get you know sort of in inducted into that world and that mindset early on 
that was reinforced at things like Sunday football, you know, every, every Sunday for, for three or four years, you're going, you're talking about having a, the right mindset, the right approach to life. And so, although I don't think a business relationship was like super on the cards always, we've always been, we've always I think been it starts because we've been close. I think, yeah. I think that's what it starts, we've been close. And we share the same values and vision, I think, in terms of life and the world. And uh, being somebody that's a self-starter, being holding yourself accountable for your own conduct and your own journey through life. Uh, I think we just share those values. And I think when Adam was an actor, I admired the fact that he looked up one day and said, this was always my dream. This is what I wanted to do. And we had the pleasure of seeing him on various shows and working in, in big productions. But he li literally looked up one day and said, look, I'm not sure this is for me. I'm not sure I want to go through this process anymore. And he was wise enough without really any prompting, he decided to go and retrain. And he retrained using his own money and his own time. And it was a gradual process that I was already working in. I had my office in, in Newtown Land, Linford in Leicestershire. And um, Adam, Adam started to work in a finance role in London. And I was sort of looking at him and saying, you know, is that where you want to be? If that's where you want to be. That's great. If you want to work for somebody and do that, that's fine. You, you've retrained. You've made that move. Fantastic. But I think he looked up one day and said, no, I think we can do this <clears> if we work on a, on a business together. And I had the ability to introduce some early clients. Yeah. So there was a good fit in terms of saying, well, I can give you some clients. And at that point in time, he literally was working at a, a desk yeah. in his kitchen, effectively, or in his bedroom. And um, we didn't really have uh, a, a, a huge involvement with each other. I literally would introduce a few clients. That, that was how it started. Yeah, and I was doing a few thousand pounds a month enough to pay the rent and keep myself down there. My fiance, who will become my wife in October. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. She's also an actor. So she was working in the West End. The last, uh, for the last couple of years, she was working on Dream Girls. Huh? Uh, so she was working in the West End, but she decided to make the move to TV and film as well. And so I remember that one weekend we were coming back, having had the weekend with the family in Leicestershire and I'd seen Friends and I came back and, I, and we had the conversation in the car where I was like, I don't think I've, it's, I'm, I think I've just realized how lonely I am. I'm sitting at this desk in this room for 12 hours a day whilst you're off doing your matinee and your, and your evening performance in town and I'm lonely. And I'm, and this isn't, and I'm, I'm not going anywhere quickly enough with this. So I would like to move back to Leicestershire, and that just coincided with the fact that her contract in Dreamgirls was ending. She, her, she decided with her agent that she was going to do more TV and film, so she didn't need to be in London to do that because that's you know filmed everywhere, and the auditions are via self tape now, not really in person auditions. So it was the right timing. It was like I need a change. I'm lonely. I need, buff I need, you know, I need to be able to go and see the boys that I grew up with and, and, spend, and spend time there. I need to be close to my family and I want to go at this properly and you no longer need to be in London. So why don't we make the move? So we moved into, we moved into a house here in, or in Leicestershire in August, 2018. I took the office with you in Newtown Linford. By November, 2018, uh, we'd launched, we just launched Linford, we just launched Linford Grey. Uh, and Lily told me she was, Lily, Lily told me she was pregnant, so we were engaged in November 2018 as well. Uh, and it's just rolled on from there. And we've, we hired uh, Head of Media and Marketing, Sophie, in September 2019. By February 2020, we, were, we hired our first junior accountant. By February 2021, we'd hired our second junior accountant. We hired a content creator in July 21. Yeah, June or July 21. Uh, and we're up to we're up to just since then. We've, there's been a little bit of churn. One of our junior accounts left. We have bought another another one in just recently, uh, which was its own challenge because the market, the, that labour market, is tough, uh, tough at the minute. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and, and you've mentioned a few moments ago, Adam, that um, back in the day when you were working for probably less than your value was at the time in the in your dad's businesses. Kevin, can you just give us a bit of a, a summary of your own history in business? Yeah, sure. Well, as Adam says, I, I sort of left corporate life back in, I think, 94. So I'm getting towards the end of my career. But I, I left corporate life because I had 
I had the dream. I had the dream of saying, well, look, I'm, I, I was I'm fundamentally a salesman. I was called a managing director. I was running a science business. Um, uh, we would, it was a reasonably large business. I think we employed 130 people, but I decided I, I, I would do better on my own. So I, I went off and bought a small laboratory and we, we left corporate life and we started business offering at the time. It was uh, microbiological food testing because it was the height of the salmonella and the listeria scares mm -hmm. back in the early 90s. So we developed those businesses and we went through some very difficult times as those, those businesses struggled. And that's where I learned my, if you like, my business turnaround skills. I learned at the coalface on how do you run a business that's got no cash? How do you run a business that loses money? How do you, you know, where, where do you focus? Where's the management information? What do you need to make a business successful? How do you build a team? How do you raise money? How do you secure finance? Those were the essential skills I learned was running what was in those days a business called the Food Technology Centre, which was struggling. Mm -hmm. And I eventually went through that whole journey of, uh, of business turnaround with that business. And we sold that business for a significant sum of money in 2006. Okay. And so that journey, uh, it, you know, my, obviously I took my family with me on that journey. I had four young sons. Yeah. And we went through that whole, you know, dad's leaving a safe corporate job with a nice salary to run a business and he's got the dream and then the dream goes a bit sour and we run out of money. I mean, I often tell the story and it's not something I'm particularly uh, embarrassed about, but I often tell the story that when these guys were young, we literally got down to a position where we had no money. You know, the only way I could feed them. I remember one, we used to go to Ikea on a Sunday because it was the only credit card that worked. You know, because I could go in, we could go into the Ikea restaurant and they could have Swedish meatballs on a Sunday lunch because it was the only, literally the only credit card I had that was functioning at one point in my life. So they went through that whole journey of, right, get out there, do something on your own, build something. And then you have to deal with, sometimes you have to deal with that adversity and when it goes wrong and, and, and you learn those skills of uh, being resilient and, and, mm -hmm. and being open to new ideas and finding solutions. Yeah, and, and those are the stories about business and entrepreneurship that you rarely hear. It's always the glamorous side of things where you become an overnight instant success, but you rarely hear about those times where, like you say, you've only got one credit card that works and there's there's not much to share around for everybody in the family. So appreciate you being so honest and open and you know diving into that insight because not everybody would find it so easy to share that. Well, I've talked to Adam about this yesterday. We were just talking and, I, and I've always wanted in life to hit on that one idea or that one inspirational business model where you launch it and it takes off and you make millions in the first 12 months. Because that's the stories you see on Instagram and that's yeah. the story you, you know, but that's not my lived experience. That's not the lived experience of our clients. Everybody yeah. that we work with in terms of SMEs are putting in extraordinary long hours, working extremely hard. And yes, they may be making a good living, but they're working very hard at it. And uh, you need to be tenacious and you need to be resilient. Mm. Yeah, they're hardworking business owners, aren't they? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, Adam, you, you grow up in an environment where you have a, a dad who's clearly got the entrepreneurial spirit, is resilient, clearly got a great work ethic. How did that affect you growing up as you started to reach the end of your, your, your education in terms of where you wanted to take your career? Had you ever had aspirations to join the, the, your, your father's business? Obviously, you went off to do the, the acting mm. at a certain point, but can you remember what impact that had on you back in your younger years? Yeah, for sure. I think, I think more than more than more than a desire to join my father's business, it probably was. It probably did the opposite, and it was a, it was a mindset that that meant you had to take responsibility for yourself, and that you have to create for yourself. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, when you go through those, you know. We obviously we were shielded from a lot of, a lot of those issues as kids. We never knew that we were we were going to IKEA. It was just it was just nice lunch at IKEA for us. Yeah. But there are there are there are there are moments that I remember, you know, mum rocket walking around four ways with a calculator and you know school uniform not fitting right and all that type of stuff. Then those those little moments. Uh, so I think it really makes you aware of the the reality of the world. And so when you, when, you know, and, and the, if you don't do something with your life and you don't take responsibility for it, nothing will happen with it. And so I think that was part of going into acting. It was like, I want to do this. I think I can make a living at it. 
and I've and I'm young enough to have the time to do this. And it's not, I'd gone and done a history degree before I went and did an MA in you know a vocational, really a vocational course in in you know singing musical and theater. yeah musical theater. Uh, so I had some backup behind me, and Pro probably important to reference the fact I sold the business by there, so we had a, we had a bit more money. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Always helps. So yeah. going and go doing an MA was a, no. something you could afford to do as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was. I am. Yeah, in that respect, very, 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 very privileged. And and you and, and as a father, I think that's probably one of the biggest things. You always, you know, whether you want to, whether you want, whether you want to admit it or admit it or not, if you if you've got a good dad, then you you know, you want to be at least as good for your children as as they have been to you. Uh, and that takes a lot that takes a lot of commitment and so you need to you know you want to create that life and so getting out of acting was all about that I, I was spending three four five months out of work unhappy before I would get that job and then somebody else three people behind a desk would be saying to you yeah you're right for this no you're not right for that then you have no control and the instigating the instant the real sort of inspirational inspirational dissatisfaction was coming off the arena tour of Jesus Christ Superstar. They put together the next tour that was going to go to Madison Square Garden and all this other stuff. And they were they and you were committed to doing that job. And the day before everybody was supposed to go out to Madison Square Garden, I actually said no to the job. So I was not in this crew. But the day before everybody was out to everybody, and I had friends who had who had continued on that job. So I was still talking to them. The day before they were supposed to fly out to New York and perform at the garden the resident director came in and just said boom one of the one of the sponsors one of the investors has pulled out andrew can't put the show on so there's no show a mm. few so people people had you know rented their flats they'd done everything to get and they were about to go and do the dream play the garden who plays that who plays the garden no one but they were going to go and do it with andrew lloyd webber and the arena tour of jesus christ superstar and it just got ripped from them with 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 lit in, and they didn't get paid Nobody, nobody cared. It was like, you're done, see you, completely disposable. And that was the moment for me where I was like, you can't, you have no control in this industry as an actor at this end of it. Maybe, you know, at higher end probably, but at this end of it, you, you're just a body on a stage and nobody cares. And, and that was the real instigating factor, factor for me to be like, I'm not even taking auditions anymore. I'm firing my agent. I'm, I'm going, I'm doing this for myself. I'm going out on my own. And so, I, and it became about, I, I, and you know, I wanted I wanted different things. I would look at the guys, the forty odd year old guys in the cast, that, who were struggling to manage their families and being on tour and having enough money. And I was thinking, well, I don't want that for my life either. So this has a sell by this has a sell by date on it. I'm better to get out now whilst I've still got some good memories and I'm still young enough to make a change, than wait five ten years, and end up pissed off and unhappy, frankly. Yeah. Uh, and so and you know, and I, we, I'd met Lily. I knew that I wanted a family, that I would want to be able to provide for that family. And that I find, I'm just, I wasn't the right type of person for it. I find having purpose in my life and having some sort of correlation between your work ethic and, and how hard you work with the result, very motivating, very rewarding. I don't find the, I don't find uncertainty mm -hmm. uh, to be, uh, but, but you know, it wasn't an appropriate payoff for me. So I was, I was ready to make that move and ready to be to my family and children what you know what my father and mother had been to had been to me what i've mind about adam at that point was that it's very hard when you're you're living in something that had been your dream to be on the west end stage in musicals mm -hmm. to give yourself a if you like a, a shelf life a, a sell by day and he actually said a couple of years early he said if i am not getting leading roles in tv or film by this day were done. Mm. Just work that methodology. Just stuck to that day, and he wasn't getting leading roles at that point. No. And he and he just switched and retrained and became an accountant. Yeah, yeah. I, I always admire in that profession to go from audition to audition to keep hearing no's to keep hearing no's until you eventually get to a yes. Obviously, you have to be quite resilient and have quite a resilient mindset. How do you feel that that's helped you or do you see how that's helped you over the last three years in building Linford Gray? Is there anything that you can take from those years of being an actor that you can see have benefited you in the building of this business that you're in now? 
Yeah, yeah, I think most certainly. Not necessarily from the ex not necessarily from from the experience of working, but I think what you you learn to communicate well, you learn to present. You're not you're not frightened of you're not frightened of being in the room with somebody. You approach things a little bit more creatively. Your skill base is perhaps not one that's based in I'm I'm you know dead on the numbers, and I'm and I'm really detailed and that and I'm great with an Excel sheet, but I can't. I can't jump on a client call and make this make sense for somebody. So you have, I think you come to the role with a different skill set and a different vision for what, I mean, one of our, one of our uh, team members here, Layla, turned around to me a few months ago and said, it's really funny because you've made accounting what you want accounting to be, mm. <laughs> which is, you know, conference calls with clients, it's content creation, it's advisory pieces. It's not send me a, a shoebox full of receipts and I'll process it in a really mind numbing, boring way and send you this back. Yeah. You know, it's much more dynamic and collaborative and involved. Uh, so I think that, that element of it for sure, I think the biggest thing I took from acting was that I am not suited to that environment. Okay. I, I need, and, 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 and if anything, it was damaging for me personally, damaged my self-esteem, damaged the way I thought about myself. And it's, and it gave me a mindset of, you know, you go to those auditions and you don't get them. The only thing that you can come away with them is, is, well, I wasn't right for that role. And it suddenly becomes okay to lose. I wasn't right for that role. There's nothing I can do about it. It's outside of my control. I'll just carry on. And I really wasn't comfortable with, with losing all the time. I'm quite, I am by nature a competitive person and I have to have the wins to keep me going. And so coming into Limp for Grey, what I really enjoyed about them for great was that it was like, yeah, you might put in 12 to 15 hour days, five days a week and work the weekends, but my billables are going up from three to five, from five to 10, from 10 to 20, from 20 to 30 and so on and so forth. And you can, there is, there is a correlation between the work that you do, the offer that you make, the time and resource you put into something and the people around you and the result that you're getting. Mm -hmm. So that was very, that was very motivating for me enough. And I felt like I'd arrived at a model that I could be, that I could work for. I, yeah, I, mean, yeah I, would, I would endorse that. I mean, we use, we use, I think it's about, it's about personality type really in terms of what you bring to it. We use a huge amount of technology in the business because that excites Adam and excites me. And that's what he brought to me. I mean, I, when I came into this relationship, I was using a traditional accountant who was using Sage on a server and you handed it over once a year and they disappeared with it for three months, brought your statutory year end accounts back and a whole lot of queries. And, you know, you ended up with a, a lack of understanding without real management information. I think what Adam brought to us first was he put us onto Xero. So I'd never heard of Xero. Xero is a technology platform that gave you live access and live data. But then what's happened over the years is we've, we've added in all of these technology platforms. And we use a huge number of metrics in the business to manage clients, uh, customer service expectation, and to manage their business and add value. But I have to say that as a culture, going back to Adam's point, is that the metric that gives us the most joy is watching our own billings number. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so that's we, the greatest sign of ring a metaphoric <laughs> bell every time we get a new client. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah, and and it's interesting you say that because in terms of vocations you've got two industries that are probably on polar opposites of the scale although from having you know if you look at the Linford Gray Associates website you can clearly see how you've taken that creativity and injected it into what is often viewed as a, a traditional old-fashioned industry but what was the light bulb moment from coming out of acting into I'm going to start an accountancy practice inspirational dissatisfaction inspirational dissatisfaction i was so unhappy doing what i was doing having no money i was like i need a change i had that i i had all you know my you know those conversations on the way into to and from manchester at five and six in the morning those conversations to and from sunday, sunday football they had set me up to believe that i was capable of achieving anything i wanted to achieve and yeah. i had an under i had i had a more i had a better understanding of profit and losses and balance sheets and dlas than most of the people my okay. age and certainly most of the business I think we, had, we had a couple of conversations about well, you're in the land of 
creative art, you're in theatre, yeah, or in, you're in film, you've done some TV pieces, and I think we had a couple of conversations of, well, maybe the migration into the business end, yeah, into being in production and into producing shows and into funding and financing shows, yeah, that's and, true, and how we look at producing accounts for shows and for theatre people. I think we had a couple of conversations yeah, about did. that, and that sort of opened up the the idea. I think to you know, how, how could we work within the skill set of being within the theatre, within the creative industries, but but actually make it a little bit more robust, a bit more reliable, a bit more financially lucrative. And I think that's yeah. where the and it started conversation off as, about accountancy came in. Yeah, and it started off as a gig that was like, well, you could still do this and still maybe audition. And so there was a lead in and then it and then it, it got a little bit bigger and then I got, became a little bit more un, even unhappier with the, where I was. And so it organically grew like that until it was until it was big enough and I, and we could and we could move it back up to Leicestershire and and yeah when when, when it moved up to Leicestershire it became a proper proper business, proper business. that was that was me saying with that was me. I'm all in I'm all in yeah. so give me you know and there's no no doubt no doubt that at that point in my life I was you know I, I was coming to you and, and you were taking me into your office you were how you you were there as my mentor and my coach and somebody who could help me build this thing and shoulder that burden and learn more about it but I'd always also been quite academic so my A level you know I'd always I'd set my my economics A level two years early I'd done you know politics English English so I was always interested in business and business administration and finance and so and I actually remember sitting on tour also also thinking it's been ages since I've learned something new I'm gonna go and pick up this this qualification whilst I'm out on tour you know, the boys spent 20 minutes on stage. It was a three hour show. I was like, I can definitely do this. And, I, and so I started, I started there from a point of also just enjoying learning and having a background in, in economics and business studies and, all, and, and, and those subjects. Okay. And Adam, Adam put a, you know, a point of pride, Adam put him through himself through the, through the exam process and the learning process and qualifying as chartered accountant yeah. completely independently. He wasn't part of a group. He wasn't, he didn't join a, you know, a, a PwC or an accounting practice that took him through it. He was completely on his own in his bedroom, doing the research, studying and funding himself through all the exams. Nice. And obviously, I mean, you're still early on in the journey of Linford Gray and there's clearly so much more to come from it, given that you're continuing to grow from strength to strength. But clearly, Adam, you're quite a, an entrepreneurial person and, and that's shown in the success that you've had so far. So, Dad, if you can think back to childhood days I know you were probably a lot of your focus was on growing the business that you were trying to grow at the time but can you think of any is it a surprise that Adams turned out to be this entrepreneurial or could you see any signs or flickers of that sort of spirit back in his younger days well I think he just he just right from being a tiny little boy he was always very very competitive so he always wanted to be winning um, okay we had what we call the uh, the bowling, bowling face and the bowling face was if we all went temp in bowling and he didn't win. Live it. For the rest, <laughs> of, the day. For the rest of the day. <laughs> to this day. So, to this day. So we've still got the family thing, a family name, which is called the bowling face. Every time one of the grandchildren have a soak, it's the bowling face. And that's Adam's face when he couldn't win. So I think he was always very, very competitive. And I think he's right. He, he's, he's academically gifted. So he's got a good brain on his shoulders. He knows how to apply himself to the work, learn a new skill. He's got a very open mind, so he will learn those new skills. And I think that's what he's brought to it. I think he's just incredibly competitive, wants to do well. I guess the flavor of the family is the self-starting, you know, take self-accountability. You're in control of your own destiny. Don't let there be a glass ceiling. If you want to achieve it, just go for it. Mm. And part of that was we were privileged enough, I guess, at that point, because I say it sold the business, to give him those opportunities. He could take time out and, and go do an MA in musical theatre and go on tour and um but you know really since we started in for gray it's it's just being i mean adam has driven it and driven it and the entrepreneurialism goes on because we we look at Linford gray but we're also looking at we take other opportunities we're, we're constantly looking at other business models and looking at how we can develop our portfolio mm -hmm. and that competitive drive adam I, I gather from what we've talked about so far, you grew up in a family with three brothers. Yeah. I presume you've got to be fairly competitive with playing with toys, friends, bikes, etc. Is that something that you sort of that was nurtured over time, or is that competitive spirit something that you feel that may have been in the DNA? 
I think it might have been in the DNA. Definitely in the DNA. Okay. In the DNA. I mean, we all eat, all, all the brothers eat very quickly. And we all <laughs> say that's because if you didn't eat quickly, somebody else ate it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but no, I, th- I mean, because I mean, all, all my other brothers, one of them, my, my youngest brother, Miles, is also very much like me, incredibly competitive. The other two are a little bit more easy going, aren't they? Yeah, they're a little bit more easy going. Uh, so I definitely, and, and I always, I would do, I've always, since I always used to do karate. And then when I was 14, I picked up Thai boxing. So from 14 to 19 slash 20, I was sort of, I was fighting, I was an amateur fighter. So I was, that was also, that was also something I was super duper interested in and enjoyed. I think generally you're characterized by somebody that's all in. Yeah. If he gets involved in it, it's completely absorbing and he's all in. The Thai boxing was completely absorbing. Musical theater was completely absorbing. And now I think it's, it's the profession of being a chartered accountant and being an entrepreneur. That's, that's, that's yeah, where building we're at. We're building a business. And he's doing it for his daughter and his family. That's what the way that's the way I saw it. We see life as a journey by you're building a platform so that the children that come after you have a better opportunity, better choices, better life chances. And then you want your grandchildren to have better choices and better life chances. And that's the sort of conversation we're having at the minute, isn't it? How do we talk about glass ceilings? We had that conversation yesterday where it was sort of said we have to kick against this idea that running Linford Gray is this and, and is the ceiling. What's above and beyond that? How do we go from how do we go from you know a very a successful business to that sort of next level? Grand Cardone, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos thing. How do you how do we break that glass ceiling? And just to return to what you were saying about the family ethos being about accountability and being in control of your own life and destiny and fortune, I think that's an ethos that we have pulled into Linford Gray and we t- and all the team members are very uh, independent and they hold themselves account. They take responsibility and they understand that what they want out of life is their responsibility. And it is available to them. And for as long as Linford Gray is the vehicle that they can achieve it, wonderful. Mm. Uh, you know? And you, you mentioned a moment ago, Kevin, that one of Adam's attributes that's clearly been um, a part of the success so far is that when he commits to something, he's all in, which can most definitely be a strength. You're fully committed. You're not going to be distracted. Do you see, is there a dark side to having that as a, a strength, Adam, when you commit to something you are all in like as with all strengths sometimes taken to the extreme there can be a, a darker side to it no, is there no. anything that you can think of adam oh i can see kevin your, your eyes have lit up a little bit there is there anything that you can shed some light on on that I, well i think there's a level of intensity which can become difficult when things aren't going well so again it's about it's about being tenacious there is a i, I think you know adam's very impatient that's true which, which is a good thing um and he's always and there's a tendency i think it's about where you are in your life as well i probably was guilty of the same thing when i was in my 30s less so now but you know there is always this temptation to be saying well you know what's it's always looking down the road saying what's what's coming along rather than enjoying the moment and living in the moment i think one of the you know one of the great things about getting older I, i guess is you start to live more in the moment and one of the one of the downsides of being hugely ambitious and being very committed when you're in your 30s and 40s, 20s, 30s and 40s is maybe a level of dissatisfaction with where you are now and constantly looking down the road, wanting something better or bigger or, you know, more. Yeah, yeah, sure. And you've already you've already picked out both of you, Adam and Kevin, a number of sort of themes that Adam, you've picked up from Kevin over the years in terms of you know, taking ownership for your own destiny, being able to hold yourself to account. Kevin, were these um, themes that you consciously wanted to instill in the four brothers or was it just from seeing you in action? And then the follow on question from that was, were those things that you developed yourself or were they passed down from future from previous generations to you? Yeah, it's an interesting one. It makes, could, could make me sound a bit, to be a, a bad father, couldn't he? Cracking on about business all the time in car journeys. But I think that's um, good. Yeah, no, I think, well, I think I come, our family background, my parents are not in business. My father was, a, uh, was in the Navy uh, and my mum worked as a receptionist. So they'd never, they'd never been anything but work for a, for a salary and a wage. 
Um, but what they are is they're people that are that that br brought me up to be self-sustaining. You know, you have to take accountability. You know, obey the law, be a good citizen, pay your way in the world, etc. So, sort of a relatively conservative view of the world, not a particularly sophisticated view of the world, but it does instill some basic values. I don't really know where it came from. I, I think when I started my career, I obviously worked in corporate life and uh, was frustrated working in corporate life, frustrated with the politics of corporate life. Mm -hmm. And I was equally as frustrated with the lack of um, correlation between your work ethic, as Adam said, your work ethic and your performance and your ability to deliver results and your earnings. And um, it was when I had had visions for a number of years. I think, again, it was sounds a bit vague, but I think it was when you know, my wife was expecting our first child that you start walking down the road thinking, well, you know, what do I want for them? Mm. How do I want them to view me? You know, I've got to be honest. Yeah. I remember having those conversations. Do I want them to be thinking about me as I'm a salesman? Or do I want them to be thinking about me as this or that? And how can I achieve a good standard of living for our family? And I, and that's the journey that I then went on in terms of a, a learning about business i mean i do remember being a salesman and plaguing to death the finance director to teach me about balance sheets and to teach me about p l's and i did do an mba privately you know on a distance learning program because you wanted to learn about business yeah. so if it wasn't enough to be a salesman i wanted to learn about how you run a business i wanted to learn, learn about how you finance a business how you understand a balance sheet yeah, there's a lot of similarities there in, in Adam's own story of taking the accounts. Yeah, I've never exactly. occurred to me, but it is very yeah. similar. I did, I did go on a journey. I didn't go on it in such a, uh, maybe in a focused and a structured way. It took me a long time to sort of go down that road and, and learn about business. And, and I still say to this day, the day I left corporate life, uh, I didn't have a clue. Not a Scooby-Doo about how you run a business. Mm -hmm. um, the day I started really knowing about business was the day I was on my own. Yeah. And, you know, you didn't have a finance team and you didn't have a treasury team and you didn't have unlimited resources. You know, you had what was in the bank that week and you had to make decisions to run your business within a budget. And we made loads of, you know, huge, mongous mistakes in the early days of running our businesses. But that's the journey that we went on. And I think it was all about, um, yeah, the entrepreneurialism. I'm not sure where that came from, but it was about a desire to be in control and to co correlate your hard work and performance with the financial results. Yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot of people will relate to that, especially that have their own children. It's something that I'm super conscious of is, is setting an example to your own children that if you want something bad enough and you work hard enough, then anything's possible. So I, I can definitely relate to you on that. So, so how would you describe your working relationship as father and son in Linford Gray at the moment? How would I describe it? Cordial. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, well, that's a good start. <laughs> we occasionally have massive blowouts. Massive, <laughs> massive blowouts. We occasionally have standard. Work. I mean, I think at the heart of it, I've worked with a lot of family businesses. I might literally be a non-executive director of a family business where they brought me in because none of the family got on you know, as is often the case yeah there were two brothers in this business who positively disliked each other and had no respect for each other and the dad brought me in to more or less act as a referee so i think at the heart of this you have to respect each other because if you don't respect or like each other it's, it's a problem and just because you're in a family doesn't mean you will respect or love or, or like each other so we have a fun basis in that we love each other I like him as a human being, which is not about love. It's just like him. Yeah. But more important than that, I actually respect his judgment. And I think he respects mine. I hope he I does. Do. <laughs> so that it means that we, we have something contribute to the relationship. When we're working together, we've got that mutual respect. I think we like each other. And then we've got the bond of, of, of family that we love each other, clearly. But that doesn't mean that occasionally... <laughs> <laughs> you don't fall out. Yeah, I can think that. In the, in usually, the, in fairness, usually, in fairness, and I'll, I'll be, be, I'll be like completely one hundred percent honest. Okay, I'm usually under a ton of pressure. Like when we've fallen out, I've been under a lot of pressure. 
I've been trying to get stuff done. I've been trying to meet my deadlines. And and Kevin, Kevin, my dad, is, <laughs> is like the last person of the day just to put something else on my desk. And I've gone, boom, not doing it. And I can kick off at him because he's my dad and we're going to come back from that, always going to come back from it. Mm-hmm. And I've and then he's gone, well, I don't need to deserve to be spoken to like that. Thank you. And then it's all, and then we've had a wrap. We've had a wrap. But, you know, you come back. I'm, I apologize. I shouldn't have spoken to you that way. I love you and I respect you. And and he's always, and you know, you've always been very gracious. Right. You've always been very gracious in accepting <laughs> that apology. Uh, and we've moved on. So I, I would say, I, and he, but he has that wealth of experience. And he is, and I think one of the other things that we that we are respectful of is that we are at different positions in our life cycle. You are, you've been through a lot of what I've been through, and you're looking at it with hindsight. You have, you've had the time to develop the patience that I am currently working on. Mm. And so you're looking at everything from above going, yeah, like, 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 a, like a mentor and a coach does and saying, yeah, but you know, don't sweat the small stuff. Think about that. And I'm, and I'm in, I'm in a frame of mind where I'm like, but if I lose this client, because I, because we don't deliver for him, it's a big deal for me and my family. So I've got to get this done. Don't put anything else on my desk. Don't break my gate. Don't put me under any more pressure than I absolutely need to be under. But, you know, we're working through that. And I think what helps that is the biz- as the business grows, you, one of the biggest things that I would change probably about the way that we've operated at Food Grey is I've taken, a, taken on too much for too long. And yeah. I, would, I, would, I would now, you know, within the parameters of what's reasonable and what the business can stand, take people on before I have them, you know, before I've judged it necessary previously. Because yeah, I think that's one of the big debates we've had is yeah. I'm absolutely committed to rapidly building a bigger team and adam is very focused on his cash flow and profitability so he slowed down if anything the development of the team i think that's fair yeah probably yeah and he's taken a huge amount of the burden on his own shoulders now i've looked at him and said yeah that is a risky strategy Adam. you're taking far too much on you're doing far too much uh great on a low cost base we're very very efficient and we're very and we're very profitable but we need to build the team and we need yeah. to build faster and it makes for a more robust business. I'd rather make less money and have a bigger team of people around us within reason, not to yeah. silly growth, but yeah, I think we've had some conversations around uh, that. We have a lot of conversations around the strategy for growth. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're, we, we've been looking at acquisitions. We've been looking at, you know, organic, ag- organic acquisition uh, by, by advertising and marketing and just acquiring new clients organically. Brand awareness, content um, creation. Yeah, so we, we tend to, I don't get involved operationally. Usually. Okay. We have a Monday morning prayer, what we call Monday morning prayers, which is uh, every Monday morning, the whole team, the whole team gets together and they're asked to contribute to that prayers meeting to tell everybody what they're doing that week, what the key objectives are, what the key issues in the business are. So that's a brief, that's as close as I get to the operational coalface. Nice. My role really is, is, is most people understand that if they run a business, it's quite lonely if you're on your own. Yeah. If you're taking all the responsibility. And I think one of the great things about this is that I just provide a sounding board and somewhere that you can, yeah, you can have a shout at me and you can have a scream and we can talk about stuff and we can maybe have, get a different perspective at the end of the week on what's going on and where we need to be. Yeah. Okay. And I, Obviously, clearly, you guys have got a great relationship that's working well for both you as individuals and the business. I think sometimes family businesses work when they have a bit of structure and, and boundaries in place, whereas other times family businesses don't need to have that in place. They can just work together organically. So have you consciously put any boundaries in place to try and make sure that you maintain your father and son relationship as well as your business partner relationship? For example, Sometimes people will say outside of work, you know, family dinner, we're not talking business. What's it like for you guys? We don't have nothing to talk about. (laughs) (laughs) I think what what we do is we keep the boundary of Adam is the managing director. And he makes all operational decisions. Mm -hmm. And that includes all, all, all issues to do with cash flow funding investment so if he is going to make a decision it's his decision and i try and play the role of saying you know typically like when we if, when we moved into we bought this office building it would be a it would be a role as any other board member would be proposing 
I believe this would be an acceptable proposal. This is how we want to make, you know, whether it's something trivial like yeah. we should invest in air conditioning. <laughs> you know, I'm not convinced that this won't be too warm to work in the winter. Let's, let's look at an air conditioning proposal and I might go and get it costed. But I would make it very clear to the people that I'm getting a proposal from that I'm not the decision maker. Okay, so okay. so that, that is so interesting. When you when you both do come to loggerheads and you've said there's been a, a couple of blowouts and you you vehemently disagree with a particular decision, how do you resolve that and move forwards? We never really disagreed over decisions, have we? Not, not, oh. not fundamental decisions about the business. It's more it's it's, uh, more, it's more the pressure of the week that builds up. It's like yeah, Kevin Kevin will have something that he needs delivered for a client that he's that he's passed on to us to deliver. And I and and I will have and I've had two and I've had a million other things to deliver on, and he said, "Well, I need that." And I asked for it last week, and I, and and then you've gone, "Well, you know, boom, it's, it just goes to the next level because the pressure has built up and needs releasing." But it's been a long, it's been a while since anything like that. Yeah, I think strategically, on most of the strategic things, we agree, and I think I just tr mm. I trust his judgment, and we're honest. You've got to be honest about your own feelings. Yeah, I've sort of, I have a, I have an appreciation of of where my where my strengths are and, and that doesn't mean i know everything and i'm great at everything so yeah. the conversation and adam says this is the direction of travel i'm more than happy to take your judgment on board and, and, if, and, and that comes down to that respect for you. vice versa as well if you know you there are there, there have been occasions where you said yeah but and this and, and, I, and it's completely understandable and then we say okay right so given that it's this way now and we agree that actually you're right and it needs to move to here how do we move that how do we move to that place and we and and we discuss and, and move through that process but in terms of like separating ourselves personally and privately and, and corporately we have a we have a huge every first sunday of the month uh we have a sunday lunch that we host and the entire like 16 members of the immediate family come together kids partners uh so there's always a, there's always a lot going on there's always events to attend there's always birthday parties I call him Kevin in the office. I call him dad among, among the family. Uh, but we also, I think, generally consider business and life pretty synonymous. Mm. Everything I'm doing, I'm doing for, I would, it would be a lie to say I'm doing it solely for my, for my wife and my child. I do it because it also gives me satisfaction. But, but, I'm, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm generating, I'm trying to generate a better life for my unit. And, dad, and dad's trying to do the same for his unit, which is broader because it encompasses his four sons and their grandchildren. And so there, there is no, it's not, it's not off the table at those events. If we, we're talking about acquiring a, acquiring a business right now. If we can, if we get 25 minutes on a Sunday where we can sit down over a coffee and be like, so what did you get a chance to catch up on that? And what do you think about that? We'll have that conversation and because we, life we, is- We life. tend not to talk about a, a family dinner merely because that yeah. matters. It would be boring for everybody else. everybody else there for us to be sitting talking about it for great. Yeah. But, we have no issue. We don't really delineate. I think that's the function of small business owners, isn't it? We don't delineate between the the business is your life. It is what you are, and it's part of the family. It's part of yeah. everything you do. So, we there's nothing off bounds. But I think just out of courtesy and good manners, we wouldn't talk about Linda Gray matters in front of the other family members at a, at a dinner because they would find it tedious and boring. Yeah. 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 And and from what you two have learned about each other over the years of working together in the way that you are in this partnership, what advice would you give to either a father or a son that were thinking of starting a business partnership with vice versa, whether it's about, I mean, you've, you've talked about how Adam, you're um, like super focused on making the business lean and, and efficient and focused on that net profit and that bottom line. Whereas Kevin, you can take a, a higher picture view and know that you've got to speculate, to accumulate, to facilitate the business growth. So you, they're different mindsets, but when you work them together, that's obviously really good for the business. So in terms of like looking to your family member, whether it's the father and son, and seeing whether you've got the, the personality or the attributes, like what's a good indicator that it's going to be a good working relationship from what you guys have learned of working together? I would say, can you... Can you disagree? Like, you know, if, if you if you fall out, is it a blowout that's going to affect the whole family? Or are you the kind of people that can say, do you know what? You know, that was that was five minutes ago. And you've got to respect one another enough to do that. I mean, I, look, I do work with a lot of family businesses in what I do. I mean, I do a lot of business turnarounds. So maybe I get a 
my data source is probably skewed because I'm getting a lot of businesses that are in trouble coming to my door. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I'm probably seeing a lot of dysfunctional relationships. So I see a lot of dysfunctional family business. Yeah. So my observations are that being going into a family business, it is it simply is the business part is more important than the family part. You have to have the, the right business model. And if you have the right business model, the people operating that business have to have functional competence. So, you know, if it's your brother, but he's functionally good at being a plasterer and you're running a plastering business and he's a great plasterer, that's immediately a good fit. Mm -hmm. If you're running a plastering business and he's not a good plasterer, that's a problem. Yeah. Because he's your brother and you can't fire him. It's very difficult to fire him. The two brothers have gone into business and one of them's a bad plasterer and they're running a plastering business. So I think you need good functional competence. So in this particular setup, this guy is a fantastic accountant. And his focus is on his focus is on how he adds value for his business for his clients, which is for me is the right focus. He's also a great communicator. So you put that package up, and I can see that we've got some good functional competence here. So the fact that he's my son then just becomes a bonus because actually I would hire this guy all day long if I was setting up a business. So I want good functional competence. So and then I want good, I want a good work ethic. I want somebody that wants to work hard and work well and is mature enough and has got a degree of maturity, emotional maturity, that he can handle and be resilient. Adam's got all of that. So when you see a good business where they've got good functional competences and good weather, whether they're families or not, they run well. Mm. And I'm not so sure it's it's about the family dynamic um, comes into play when all those other things aren't working. Because then mm. what you get is, I mean, we've got a client at the moment who's got his two sons working in the business and he works really well with one son, but, the, but with one son, he doesn't work well at all with. And when you actually identify it, it's, well, what, what, what's going wrong? And you say, well, you know, he, he, he doesn't have a good work ethic. You know, he's leaving at four o'clock every day. So I said, well, what he's really doing is abusing the fact that he's your son to skive off early and that you're not going to hold him to account. And that's when it starts going wrong, I think, as a family business, that you start mm -hmm. having to cut somebody. You know, in this particular case with our client, the dad doesn't really know how he can address his son's lack of work ethic. And every time they have a fallout, the son resigns and goes away for three weeks and then comes back three weeks later and said, well, I've lost that job. Can I have a job again? Dad? <laughs> So, you know, that's where it goes wrong as a family because dad in those instances, he doesn't really know how to manage because it's his son. Mm. Really going wrong is you need to be tough in that particular circumstance. You really need to have a sit down with that boy and say, look, you know, I will support you in any way I can. I will open up whatever opportunities I can, but it's wrong for you to work in the business. Yeah. I, th I think um, what an inter there's been an in interesting... I perhaps an interesting shift in the relationship you know when you when I started at Infogra I was very much a new business owner uh and I, and and but but there's as you grow in experience those roles and the dynamic shift I you know I've become more knowledgeable about them for great and about running them for great than perhaps you are and I'm certainly and I'm certainly you know yeah you know, the, your miles at the very beginning of my accountancy training you were you were telling me oh no that's not quite right it's this and then there was a definite shift where I became more knowledgeable about the technical the technical aspects of tax and accounting than you and that's a shift so I think you also have to be ready to approach that person uh as an equal as their as their role shifts and be capable of understanding and accommodating that changing dynamic yeah, I mean, make no mistake, Liv and Gray is Adam's business. You know, it's Adam's business. He is, he is the managing director and he is the strategic head and he has the vision and he's driving on. My role really is to be a mentor and to, I would say mine's a classic chairman role as a non-exec. No, very little operational responsibility, just there as a guiding hand, reviewing decisions, reviewing ideas, coming up with options, making sure we don't you know step on any minefields and, and yeah. bombs and we don't we don't do anything silly um and blue sky in the next phase with me and i think because he's got if you've got good functional competence you've got a good work ethic then the rest of it will flow nice very nice and, and what what is the what what is the vision for linford gray obviously you've already reached a point of success after not being in operation for, for many years at all and you're growing from strength to strength like we mentioned earlier but well adam what's your vision for the business where do you see it in the future I want it to go as big as it can go. I think there are a lot of 
threats to accounting industry. You see now you've got software systems like Ember and even QuickBooks that will say, oh, just bang your numbers into this software system and it will give you your tax return. So I, th I so saying where it will be is, is difficult because I think the role of the accountant has to change in order to remain relevant. And we're on that journey now. Uh, but I would like to, you know, in terms of its, in terms of its growth and its brand, I'd like to take over, you know, my goal is to take over the world. I'd love to be a national, I'd love to be a national brand. I'd love to be a thought, you know, even, even more of a thought leader in the space than we are, than we are currently. And I'd love people to think of, I'm starting a business. I'm going to go with Linford Gray, not because they're that, you know, they're your local tax assist shop at the end of, on the, on the corner of the high street that do your return for 99 pounds, but because we are a premium provider of compliancy and advisory services that will nurture you, give you a personalized service, and that, that understand the, the pressures of being in a small and medium sized business. So for me, it's a, I, I wanna grow into, an, into a national brand and a, nas and, a, and a national business. Very nice, big vision, big vision. Sounds exciting. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, you know, how we get there, on what time scale, uh, and, and what the team looks like, throughout that are all are all up for are all sort of being worked out week to week month to month aren't they and and you know and all those types of things but that's definitely that's definitely the goal and along the way i would like to you know i think one of the things that i struggle with is you very much with i very much settle into the role of business owner in in linford graham the managing director i run the business we know what we're doing in terms of this that and the other and deadlines and acquisitions and then we know what this but i but i want to you're always faced with, okay, well, this generates wealth for me and gives me some more opportunities. So how am I going to use that to, to further develop myself? And how am I going to step back into the role of entrepreneur and execute on the next project? And do I have the time and the space to do that? Well, so I think, I think that's one of the, that's one of the things that, we'll, that, we'll, that I'm focused on as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, we've got a couple more questions for you before I let you guys go for the day, but I've loved the conversation and I love the dynamic between you two. You can tell it's like totally genuine and, and I can see it must be a lot of fun working over at Linford Gray Associates. So, um, Adam, if you could think about your success over all of the years so far, we've talked quite a lot about what you took from watching your dad in action over the years. And you could just pick one thing that you've learned from your dad that you'd want to pass down to your daughter, something that you really want to instill in her. If you could just narrow it down to one concept or idea or attribute, what would you say? Take responsibility for yourself and your outcomes. I mean, she is, a, my daughter is a mixed race little girl and she's a woman. Uh, and, I, and I would never want her to feel like the color of her skin or her gender provide her with a glass ceiling or a reason that she, or, that, or, or for it to be the reason she didn't quite achieve what she wanted to achieve. And so my, the message that I would take from my father and pass down to Evangeline is that you are responsible for your outcomes. None of those will be, at the end of the day, none of those will help you. Those, those things, you know, putting those ceilings on yourself won't help you. So take responsibility, work hard, work smart, uh, and, and, and you will achieve the outcome that you want to achieve. You will, and you will reap the, the and you will reap the rewards of the value that you add. And although it's a very, perhaps for me personally, you know, you're like, why am I not Elon? Why am I not Jeff Bezos? Well, I didn't invent Amazon. I get the, I get the reward that I get for the value that I add in society. So if you're unhappy with that, you have to find a way to change that. And that's on you. Which nice. is probably a very strange message given that i'm sat here with my father and we've been in business together and i've shared that burden with you so it's probably a bit hypocritical of me to say that but that's what i would want for my daughter it sounds like she's got a bright future ahead most definitely she's super she's so smart and kevin after after watching adam in action all these years especially as you've had this business relationship since being at linford gray is there anything that you can pick out that you've learned from watching adam in action <laughs> <laughs> uh well i think i think <clears throat> he i think number one he's he's applied himself in, the, in a, a focused way that i just never did and uh, now i don't know that's you know that could be just to do with his his intellectual ability um there could be a whole range of reasons why he's much he's more competitive than i than i ever was 
So we talked about my other sons there, you know, we've got two sons that are reasonably competitive and two sons who are a bit more laid back. I'm probably a bit more laid back than, than Adam. Um, so I don't, I don't have the same competitive drive. And I think he is incredibly laser-like in terms of his focus and his work ethic. And I probably wasn't willing to make those sacrifices. I had other, you know, I, I, I was probably take, took a slightly more balanced approach to life. So my, my journey has been slower, no question about it. I think he's on a faster journey than me. And I think he, he's determining that by the amount of work and focus he wants to put into it. He's trying to achieve a balance with family life and, he's, and being a good dad. And he's a fantastic dad. Um, but yeah, I would say looking at him and the, the, the thing I admire and probably the thing I worry about the most is the amount of work and effort and time he's dedicating and the focus and the single mindedness that he's putting into this. Nice. And just, just on hearing that, Adam, how does that make you feel? Do you know what? The biggest thing I heard there was you think I'm a good dad. <laughs> yes, you are a good dad. Which is nice to hear. I, I personally take a view on that. that she's, too, that she's very young at the moment. So it's easy to be a good dad. I think time will tell whether I'm a good father. Uh, but I hope to be. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I think you're, I, I think I get my competitive spirit from you. Uh, but yeah, I would say, I mean, and we talk about life, life, the life, the work-life balance. And you could look at that week to week. You could look at that day to day and say, well, look, I've finished at 5.30 in my evenings and my evenings and I spend those with the family. And that's the work-life balance. I tend at the moment, perhaps because of my age and where I'm at, but I tend to look at it on a, on a lifetime bit. And if, I, and, if, and if I do, you know, two weeks worth of work or two, you know, if I do 80 hours a week inside a week and I get there twice as fast as anybody else, then I can stop earlier. Mm -hmm. I can enjoy, I mean, whether, whether I have the mindset to do that, whether I have the, whether I'm the right type of person to take a step back at that point, I don't know. You get sort of addicted to, addicted to delivering on those things and working hard. But I think you could look at it like that and say, well, look, you know, I might, I might work so hard for the next five years, but I might, but then I might exit and be, and I might have set up my children and, and, and my family, and then I can take a step back. And at that point, my daughter is only six years, seven years old, and I can be there for her, you know, absolutely 100% through the teenage years and her adolescence and, 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 and her adulthood. So, you know, I think that's, that's something that we all have to arrive at. On an yeah, it, it reminds me of the quote, which goes something along the lines of you prepare to work like others won't so that later on in life, you can live a life that others can't. That's the sort of mindset that you've got I've, at the moment. I've never heard that. I've never heard that, but I love that. Yeah, that's a good quote. Okay. I yeah, I would say, you know, yeah, I think that's, I think that's where we're at. I think that's where we're at. Yeah, and I think, I think the other thing is, which we haven't talked about, is that Linford Gray, being in business does give you some flexibility. Yes. So you can choose. I mean, everybody's got more flexibility from since they've been working from home, but everybody now gets so that flexibility gives you some choices that enable mm. you to maximize your life. So if you need to be there because they've got a, a, a little show to do and during nursery, you can you can take off two hours and be there till 10 o'clock while nursery do their little show and you can be there to support your daughter because what the hell is your business? You can work till 10 o'clock that night. So, you know, the Linford Gray gives you the flexibility to be It does. My, my fiance Lily will often go have to go and do jobs because she's filming this or filming that. And it would be, okay, well, I'm taking Evangeline for the next two days then. That's, you know, and, and I, can, I can take that time off work. I can, con I can conference in from home whilst Evangeline's napping. I can schedule my work around or I can work in the evenings. And I can take Evangeline for a couple of days and it doesn't impact the day-to-day -day delivery of anything here because we have the team. Yeah. And my, my final question for you, Adam and Kevin, if anybody wants to find out more about Linford Gray, if we've got any listeners or watchers that are looking for a, a more modern approach to accountancy, or they just want to follow one of you guys online and, and keep in touch with what you're doing and, and what's happening, whereabouts can we find you online? Uh, our website is probably one of the best places to go, www.linfordgray.co.uk. And, uh, and from there, you'll find our Instagram and our YouTube channel and Twitter and, and LinkedIn pages. So yeah, that's where that's where it is for, and we update those regularly. We've got a whole team that that are dedicated to making sure that our social channels are are entertaining. 
Yeah, I, I had a quick Ricky before. I don't like to do too much research because I like to find out things as the guests do as, as we're going through the conversation. But uh, on the social media and the, on the marketing side, it's definitely very different to what you would consider on most traditional accountants. So well worth checking out for any listeners or watchers. Well, Adam, Kevin, thank you so much for uh, taking some time out of, uh, of your day to join us on the Next Gen Show. It's been a fascinating insight into a father and son relationship into a business that's continuing to grow from strength to strength. And I just wish you all the best for the future and look forward to keeping in touch with all that you're doing. I knew. I appreciate yeah. it. Thanks for your Thanks, time. Babe. Thanks, guys. See you soon. See you, babe. So there you have it. Another brilliant business interview on the Next Gen Show. A big thanks to Adam and Kevin for joining me on the show and their social media expert, Sophie, for reaching out to make it happen in the first place. Now, if you are a next generation leader or director in a family business, check out the free guide I've put together, 25 ways to level up your impact as a leader in the family business over at nextgenbusinesscoaching.com. There'll be a, a link somewhere on the screen or send me a message and connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll be happy to send a copy of that to you. As always, thanks for watching. Make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. And of course, if you've got time and you enjoyed the show, please feel free to leave me a five-star review to help spread the word. Stay tuned for more amazing interviews with some seriously accomplished next-generation leaders of family businesses. And until the next show, I'll see you then.